and get started. So thank you all for coming. Um, hope the time change didn't confuse anybody. I think I got it right for once <laughs> and, the, and the announcement. Um, so tonight we have uh, Greg and Ray are going to talk about uh, the Oxford conference that he just attended. And um, so partly their, their presentations, but then also them representing our society um, at the Oxford conference. Um, so before I jump in, the only thing I wanted to add is since we didn't do the workshop, we toyed around with the idea of doing some of the technical uh, talks, more of the lectures as part of the journal club. Um, but the journal club's been going so well and so successful, I really wanted to run it by you guys effectively. Like if, if that's something you guys are interested in, um, we would do that. If you're not, then we'll just continue doing what we've been doing. Um, so I'm going to uh, write that up a little bit more formally in the um, next um a newsletter so to give everybody a heads up but uh, probably the beginning of next year we'll have our normal journal club and then have some more formal lectures which would replace the technical sections of the workshop that we didn't do so so with that i'll uh, turn it over to ray well actually uh greg can you give me the yeah you, you do you have the ability to share screen you should oh okay um then I better find where I do that. I forgot. Bottom of the screen. I forgot. I know where it is. I just forgot to do it. <laughs> ah, there it is. All righty. Now is that on? Not yet. Oh, there it goes. Okay, good. All righty. So, um, well, let me uh, tell you a little bit about what I tried to do here. I I tried to talk about the organization, but I also wanted to talk about some of the work that has been done. And I ended up choosing um, two, uh, well, two archeological sites that uh, papers, one from the um, first volume of papers and then one from the second volume and um, or a couple of them from there, but but um, as it turned out, I ended up doing a little um, kind of mini uh, session on the Tewa people, as you'll see. So um, this was partly accidental to start with, and then I realized what was going on, and that my choices led me in that direction, and uh, so I I was ended up being kind of happy about the the um, all three three papers together in it. But first, um, I want to share the screen. There we go. Um, so here's the outline. Talked a little bit about the organization, um, about the US Southwest, because some of those people probably don't know anything at all about the U.S. Southwest. Um, and then talked about Jackson's Castle, um, star beings of the Tewa um, Pueblo people. That's, um, of the, of, um, that's a paper about um, ta current Tewa star lore. And then of course about Yucca House. And then I had to throw in uh, my favorite subject, in the end because, and you'll see why uh, when I get there. And then a little bit about, uh, a little bit more about our organization. So um, you can all read the screen here. Um, you, you know this material, uh, but I wanted them to see um, what we are, how large we are and give them a copy of our or a link to our website. So, and then I, um, one of the things that I thought was important to do was point out how many Native American tribes there are in what can be called the, the Southwest. And you can pick the borders um, that you like better than this, but I think this is a pretty good rundown of uh, what the Southwest comprises and geographically, and, uh, and also the, the people, the indigenous people that live in the area. And then a little bit about the landscape um, that, you know, that is basically a desert um, environment, um, the mountains and, and um, 
uh, canyons and so forth. Um, and the um, fact that uh, uh, it's pretty dry. And then to point out that um, people are still using solar horizon calendars here. There was, um, yeah, and, and um, I thought that was important to mention to people that this is a living, um, cultural astronomy in the Southwest is, is a living um, set of, 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 of um, cultural events and, and characteristics. So some nice pictures of, of the area, uh, mainly of our area here, but um, the, um, I thought it was important to give them a sense of the type of structures that you're likely to find in um, of ancestral Pueblo people. And then our two volumes uh, to set this up for Greg, who was um, during the breaks at the table selling these volumes, uh, both of us brought volumes with us. So we had, we had stuff to sell. Um, and then to Jackson's Castle. And for me, I think this is a really, really interesting and important structure um, with, um, which is where, for those who are not familiar with it, let me go back a minute. Um, here, along the ridge, is the uh, Jackson's Castle, the, the archaeological feature. Over on the left is the shadow of the, the small cerro or, or peak um, that um, casts a shadow on this, this structure throughout the year. Uh, well, throughout half the year, at least, from the um, from the um, how to say this from from the spring equinox through to the um, fall equinox um, is this structure is covered by uh, the shadow at sunrise, and then afterwards uh, it isn't, and and that was significant to. Uh, both um, Bob Bernhardt and Scott Portman um, for the following reasons. Um, and here's the, just a different picture of it. I, I took a drone image here. It's BLM land, so there's no restriction against using drones out here. Um, the only thing that it could drop on if it failed um, would be me or um, maybe a cow uh, that uh, might might scare a cow, but that's it. At any rate, you can see here that, and I pointed this out in the in my talk that there's these um, indentations, and these are um, kivas in this structure, and um, the um, important item here is one of the one of the a structure which is structure f and um that if you well, i'll show you in a second how that works um the point is that the um bob and scott knew ahead of time that jackson's castle might be an ancestral tewa structure because there's a uh, whole lot of, of other evidence that uh, doesn't show up in, in this research that suggests that it might be. Uh, and one of the features, um, two of the features uh, that show that is one, the shrine at the top of the hill to the east, very typical of what goes on in the Eastern Tewa Pueblos that they have, will have a, a shrine often at the top of a hill um, that is important to them, has, has a lot of, of uh, religious connotations. And the, um, also that the, 
structure seems to be divided in two so that um, it has the um, halfway through the year, they change leadership in the Pueblo. So it's a moiety structure. And here's a diagram from the work that Crow Canyon Archaeological Center did to create a map of this thing. And this is just to, to emphasize what I said here, that here's the shrine in this direction. And at um, spring equinox, the shadow, uh, or, or if you look at along this, where are we here? Sorry. If you look along this line, the blue arrow uh, at uh, vernal equinox sunrise, you see um, the following. So it's, um, it's a, um, uh, Bob and Scott believe that this indicates that it's certainly um, a type of structure that fits the table of uh, way of doing of living. Um, then I thought it would be useful. Um, originally, I just thought, gee, we have we have a uh, um, marks in my paper that shows some of the, in, in, a, in a pictorial way, shows um, some of the constellations of the Tewa people. And uh, Pablita Velarde um, wrote a story uh, that she says is from her, um, from her experience uh, living in the Pueblo and learning these stories as a child and um, drew this painting. Um, and it has all kinds of, of um, wonderful detail in it. Um, the colors are directional colors. Um, you see the stars actually showing. We see Orion here, the, what she calls the stars of decision in, in the story which is uh, Castor and Pollux, and then Leo and the Big Dipper and the Small Dipper. So, um, and the animals of the four directions. And um, so all kinds of cosmological information in this, in this image. So um, we also, um, that, by the way, I, I should say Mark is the one who put me onto this story. I didn't know about it before, um, but I when he mentioned this, I got very excited about it because I thought, gee, there's these other stories that I did know about in um, Parsons' <laughs> Table Tales and in um, this book by Marriott and Raichlin of American Indian mythology. Um, so. I, and, and, and also J.P. Harrington's eth ethnography, ethnogeography rather, of the Tewa Indians. So I thought that was also useful to explain to people that here's some, some um, contemporary information, or more or less contemporary, in the last, the last hundred years at least. Uh, so, and then um, uh, showing the different constellations shown, uh, the story um, goes along, um, starting with Long Sash and, and showing the endless trail, the Milky Way, and then, and so forth. The story actually names all of these places along the way. Um, then there's some other ones that, um, that uh, Mark felt he could identify from the story and from the way the sky looks but they were not mentioned specifically by, uh, by Velarde. And then um, also we were able to get from this painting, uh, the different beasts and the directional colors and so forth. So I, sh I showed this. And then finally this nice last image, uh, which is also in her book, uh, showing some of the stars again. And then um, I thought it was really important to um, show 
or talk about uh, Bernard Bell's paper from our uh, 2016 conference uh, of Yucca House. And this is this unexcavated site. It, it, um, if you've never been there, it, it looks like a pile of rubble um, with a lot of, of sagebrush and other bushes all over it. So it's hard to tell what's actually there. But one of the things that um, one of the uh, amateur archaeology groups here did was, was um, to map the um, part of the structure that doesn't show or is, is not shown in the original map that Crow Canyon Archaeological Center did of this structure, uh, which shows a series of kivas. And um, uh, Bernard felt that these, those structures were placed to provide calendrical anticipation of ceremonial events. Um, and he actually went to the site and, and um, took uh, imagery of it uh, to show, to demonstrate that. Uh, he also used this uh, uh, advanced photo utility, um, which uh, Dave Dearborn originated. And um, I'm wondering if we shouldn't explore that a bit. Um, I didn't have a chance to work with Bernard about it, but I'd like to see us um, take a look at that, um, that piece of software and see if it's something that we could make uh, use of in, in any of the work that we do. And then uh, I just thought it was useful to show them <laughs> the, the place, um, Sleeping Ute, and the, um, this knob up here, which um, shows up very nicely if you go a little bit south from this picture. And um, it's, a, it's a, basically a lava plug that uh, the sandstone around it had been eroded away. So it, it's, it's a landmark that's easily seen and understood and uh, noted. And um, the archeological site is down here on the slope. And here's what um, the sun setting over the, this toe of Sleeping Ute uh, Mountain. And here, seen from this, uh, one of these two kivas here. So um, this, this it's interesting because this land was private land that then got donated uh, fairly recently to the uh, park. And this is, uh, this Yucca House is uh, managed by the Park Service. And then finally, I just wanted to um, show that I, 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 that I had finally resolved my doubts about the measurements that we had done in, in um, Chaco Canyon of Casa Rinconada uh, back in the 80s uh, because they were always sub suspect from the standpoint of what's, were we measuring the original uh, circular structure or, and other features in it, or had it been reconstructed sufficiently that um, we got the wrong impression from our measurements. And uh, fortunately, uh, we were able to uh, uh, get help from somebody who knew Gordon Vivian's writing, that Gordon Vivian, the original person in charge of the, the dig for this, had, had made and recorded uh, of the map of the interior of Casa Rinconada. And it fits with the data that, uh, that we gathered uh, perfectly. And then finally, um, talked a little bit about the uh, society's projects and services, <laughs> our, our goal, which we haven't been able to meet of a conference every two years largely because of the uh, COVID. Also the goal of having a technical workshop between the conferences. 
And then um, noted for people, the uh, monthly journal club and our Facebook page and our YouTube channel. So, um, and that was my presentation. Very good. Very so, good. Um, so basically that's it. And, and um, if anybody's got a question about it, uh, a quick one, we can do that. But we've got other stuff to do. Ivy, did you have something to say? No, but that was really fun. So thank okay. you. Okay. Good. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Mark, did you have something, I think? Oh, no, I was just saying it was a great presentation. Well, thank you. <laughs> okay. Okay, that's that. Let's see if I can figure out how to start mine up. <laughs> hey, you're the host. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, there we go. Started, there we go. Huh? Oh, good. Come on. Mm, this is a little different. Mm. It looks good on our end. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh. I don't know what I'm just trying to figure out uh, my 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 screening here. <laughs> okay, well I guess I get to be in the corner then. Yeah. Okay. So what I wanted to do is uh, give my presentation that uh, that I gave at uh, in La Plata, Argentina, and it's on the Escalante Building and Landscape Orientation and Documentation Study. It slightly remain documenting a cultural landscape. Um, what is becoming increasingly um, apparent uh, through time is that the uh, study of cultural astronomy is really being uh, brought into and incorporated into the uh, study of uh, landscape archaeology and cultural landscapes where it has a rightful place. Uh, and so the idea of what is a cultural landscape becomes the first question. And one of the uh, definitions that the National Park Service has given is that a cultural landscape is a geographic area inclusive of its cultural and natural resources, including the geology, wildlife, domestic and botanical environments that represent a symbiosis of human activity in the environment. In other words, it's a totality of the landscape. It's not just an archeological site. In the past, archeologists go out and draw site boundaries around sites and that is the site. They don't, had not really go out farther than the site to the surrounding area, the, the biotic environment, uh, the animals, the landscape itself, the distant horizon, and, and the sky, of course, itself, too. Uh, what we're studying is cultural landscape. So what are the elements of a cultural landscape survey that we're trying to do? Uh, throughout all of the entire process is uh, one first thing you have to do is create a research design. This involves asking questions. Uh, and one of the questions we have to ask is of the uh, indigenous communities, the descending communities, of what kind of questions do they want asked about their ancestral sites? So we have a consultation part built into every step of a cultural landscape survey. Research design involves questions, selecting a site, consultation, and uh, getting the appropriate permits. Uh, the next step, of course, is a site assessment, one of which is uh, learning about the site itself, its legacy data, its past use, past uh, excavations and reports that have been done, and uh, learning how to uh, go into a site, greet a site, and the consultation that goes along with that. Build documentation is architectural documentation, horizon survey forms, which we're developing as part of this, uh, this project at Escalante Pueblo. And then there are the results of the hey, survey. Here. Assess the buildings, it's look at their orientation, and that's too nice look at look their, um, they're mm -hmm. starting to come loose here. Uh, look at their, their, how they're oriented on the landscape and how they line up with a landscape feature or astronomical uh, events. Vaccine? 80 bucks. 
Hang on. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, so we have to share the results with the descendant communities mostly is, is most important and then publish results in peer reviewed uh, articles and publications. Uh, research divine, you invest where for Escalante Pueblo when we went up there was to investigate the placement of the building, its orientation and alignment. And those two words to me have a different meaning, orientation and alignment. Alignment is very precise with specific uh, events or features. Uh, orientation is in the neighborhood, it doesn't have to be specific or precisely aligned. It can be attached to or looking toward a feature. Uh, one of the other things we wanted, are working at, and we're going to work at through the workshop series, either uh, in person or online, is developing new forms about how to record horizon features and test new technologies and methods. Uh, one of the things we first thing we did was review the documentation of the Canyon of the Ancients. Uh, Escalante Pueblo is located at uh, within the Canyon of the Ancients National Monument in southwest Colorado near Dolores. It's the main site right by the uh, new Canyon Ancients Visitor Center Museum, previously known as the Anasazi Heritage Center. Uh, so we reviewed the records from there, basically one book uh, by Sandy Thompson, the uh, Escalante community, and then the site report itself, which was done by David Brennanitz, or supervised by David Brennanitz, the original excavation site in the 1970s. We have to, you know, to set, uh, consult with descendant communities again, learning about the questions, learning about the site, what parts of the site may be important that we don't normally see from our perspective, and uh, document the site with the standard tools, uh, measurement tapes, the odd lights, those kinds of features. The other thing we're trying to do is test a few of uh, uh, different kinds of more modern technologies, smartphone applications. There is a, a uh, uh, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration mobile magnetic field calculator, which will help you not only with your location, but to determine the magnetic, magnetic declination that day in that vicinity. And also we're working with a lot more with uh, photogrammetry, uh, building three-dimensional models so that they can be placed inside of a terrain model which can then be placed into a uh, with, you know, terrain model with accurate horizon features, which then can be placed into a larger astronomical program such as Stellarium. We'll talk more about that later. Escalante Pueblo itself is about uh, 23 rooms. Uh, only about a third of it is excavated. This is the only excavated portion of the site, the Kiva and this set of rooms. Most of the site back over in here is not excavated. Uh, what the excavation showed that there were very two very clear occupational phases. Uh, the first one was about 1130 um, CE, 80 for the archaeologists. Uh, and then there was a later occupational period into the 12, uh, late 1100s, early 1200s. Uh, but one thing we did learn from the site report is that the architecture changed over time. The site itself, Escalante Great House Pueblo, is located on top of a prominent knoll or hill. And there are some other sites in the vicinity. Uh, the Reservoir Village site is just off to the, a uh, little bit to the southwest, which is a great house, great Kiva, a uh, wall structure complex that immediately precedes in dating the Escalante Great House Pueblo, the first occupational phase there. So the folks at Reservoir Village were looking up to the top of the hill site next to them. One of the comments that we got from Mary Wiaki in our group was that the hilltop up at Escalante Pueblo was important before that place was built. And so this fits in with what we're seeing in the uh, distribution of archaeological sites in the area. Greg, you might mention that, uh, and I'll do it. Uh, okay. Mary Mary um, is a member of the Tewa tribe, or, right, or right. Tewa yeah. speaking groups. Yeah, she's Santa Clara. Santa Clara, one of the uh, Tewa 
Table of Pueblos, yes. Um, Escalade uh, Pueblo itself, uh, this is how it appears today if you go up and visit it. Uh, this is the, the Kiva and this set of rooms over here, are the ones that are excavated, the remainder of their Pueblo is unexcavated. What we learned from going into the archeological record is that this block of rooms on the south here were added on in the later Mesa Verde reoccupational phase. Also, these two walls were dry laid walls and Chaco and grade houses do not, uh, the Chaco and style masonry do not do dry laid walls. That's a characteristic of Mesa Verde reoccupation. So if we were to imagine what this site looked like before this set of walls was built and these two walls were built inside and Kiva B out front, we would have a completely different looking Pueblo. Now, while this area is not, is not excavated, it would be very likely that these walls are also the same as these. Because if you make that, uh, uh, it's an assumption, but it's a, it's a valid assumption. You end up with a site that has much different uh, geometry and appearance than the other great house. There's a great deal of symmetry and precision built into this site. So what we did is we set up uh, various uh, theodolites, took measurements, and what we did is we really paid attention to the orientation of the exterior walls, specifically the eastern wall and the southern wall, and also took a look at how the site was built uh, from a uh, pers from a perspective of this, the Kiva A was built first. All of the walls attached to it. So we know the Kiva A was built first. And so taking a center point at that uh, from that Kiva and extending it out to the corners, we started to take a look at the geometry of the Great House Pueblo itself. And this is what we came up with, is that the, the east wall is not true north-south. It's actually five degrees off of true north-south. Uh, to the or, orienting the site to the southwest, south southwest, very unusual in this area. And so we have a, a it's not cardinally aligned, but it might be cardinally oriented. It's close. Uh, but they seem to have done a very specific job creating a uh, using triangular methods and also creating a 90 degree corners at these walls. And on the south wall, it's nine. It's oriented to a peak, not to the to due east west. And to the uh, west, it's oriented off to the bear's ears, which is another architect or another geographic feature at the distant horizon. Later on, when they rebuilt all these walls, the Mesa Verde people came in or Mesa Verde reoccupation phase about eleven eighty to about twelve twenty. Um, what we found is that they were very careful to maintain these relationships when they built this on. They maintained this 90 degree corner, this orientation to the north, this orientation to the east, and this orientation to the west. And the geometry was maintained too. So the people that came in with the Mesa Verde reoccupation period, they honored the structure. They honored the architecture that was existing there. So that was an attachment to that idea of that kind of architecture. And there's some thought that in the Mesa Verde, there was in the Mesa Verde reoccupation times that there was a, an attempt to uh, revitalize the Chacoan uh, system, uh, the Chacoan Great House system that existed in the area. But these orientations were maintained. We did not specifically find any um, astronomical alignments for the solstices or equinoxes, but we didn't need to have those in this site because of the uh, topography. It's on a hilltop with an irregular horizon around it. One of the orientations here, this is the, uh, the east wall looking north, and there is definitely an orientation to the set of peaks on the horizon. It's an otherwise flat horizon. It's not precisely on it, but it definitely goes out and grabs those peaks and brings them in.
and off on the south wall of the Pueblo is oriented off to the uh, east is about here. But this is five degrees off. That's the top of Mount Hesperus. And Hesperus, how do you go back? <laughs> There you go. Uh, Hesperus Peak is uh, one of the well, one of the sacred mountains. It's very important in the um, to many of the, the indigenous people, the descending communities in today. Hesperus is uh, there's a definite attachment to that peak. And the south wall also goes off to the Bears Ears uh, due to the haze and things like that. This day you really couldn't see it, but this is what the Bears Ears it forms a a definite great geographic feature on an otherwise flat horizon. So what we're seeing here is that these folks appear to be uh, using the rooftops of the Kiva probably as their place to do their observations of solstices and equinoxes and such on the uh, horizon, but they, they took this bubble and attached it to distant points on the horizon. And one of the things Ray, right, right after in the, uh, the uh, conference sent to me was a paper by Wes Bernardini and uh, another co-author about uh, landscape features, distant landscape features, and uh, the attachment and how, how they bring these things into the village. So we're going to be taking a closer look at that one. One of the important things that we did was a lot of photogrammetry, and this is the general photogrammetric uh, picture of the photogrammetric model that we created at Escalante Pueblo. And so uh, this is, we're gonna see if this works now. <laughs> this is where we crashed out last time. Okay, slight technical problem, but yeah, this is the, this is the, the model we have of Escalante Pueblo. And uh, you can see the, uh, the edges, are much more well defined. We're actually going out into the landscape so that we can import this into terrain models. And you, but we don't have the distant horizon. That's what we have to incorporate this into terrain models for. But we have a fair amount of detail. What we need to do is continue refining this model uh, and taking and getting better architectural detail on the outside of the walls and inside the Kiva so that we can continue to do our studies this year on, on uh, this particular site. Uh, basic results of the, the study that we did were that Escalante Great House Pueblo was constructed at the location and oriented to the landscape for a very specific purpose. We need to continue uh, doing more documentation in site, getting better, uh, refining our measurements. Uh, it appears that both occupational phases, the Great House occupational phase started out used uh, geometric and symmetrical architectural construction characteristics to build the site. They very carefully built it. The only other site that I've seen that I exhibits this kind of care in its geometry and its building symmetry is Sun Temple up at Mesa Verde National Park. A lot of the same geometrical principles were used in building that site, uh, but it is a site that probably dates from 1220 through about 1280. So those kinds of principles may have been carried up into there. Uh, the characteristics were maintained by the uh, reoccupation of Mesa Verde, maybe as a way of venerating that site or um, uh, participating in the Chaco and revitalization of the central, in the central Mesa Verde region. Uh, we did not observe any solar or lunar alignments. Uh, but again, that is, I think, chiefly because up on top of there, up on top of the Kiva top, you had the irregular horizon around you. You didn't need to do it. You didn't need to put those alignments into the architecture or features. In fact, only rarely do they do that. Only rarely among the Puebloans today and everything we to work, only rarely do they put it into the architecture itself or features. Um, a small percentage primary way, and Steve McCluskey confirmed this, and it's horizon, it's all about horizon calendars. And from here, they have a beautiful, wonderful horizon calendar available to them. But we have to go back and document it more. I just wanted to thank everybody in the crew, <laughs> especially Canyon Ancients National Monument folks, uh, Ray O'Neill, the monument manager, 
He was the person that signed off on our drone permit. And I'm sorry, Ray, but yes, you do need to have a permit to fly a drone at Jackson's Castle. It's in the monument. <laughs> so. Well, yes. <laughs> you have to catch me first. I know, that's true. <laughs> okay, and uh, Vince McMillan at the monument is um, the, our monument archaeologist, and he was very instrumental in helping us. And our crew, myself, Rick Allen, Chris Dombrowski, Ray, Dude Valentine, uh, Mary Wacky, and Lawrence Katernak, partner. We all work together on this project, and we hope to have them and a lot of you working with us in the future. And uh, so, for the future, what does 2023 look like? Our field season for 2023, we have lots of options. We are going to continue working at Escalani, uh, Pueblo. Uh, we have to do more documentation over the winter, help them develop their graphics and get the information that we have developed and are developing out to the public through their interpretive programs. Uh, there are a couple of sites that I um, would like to try and visit to do some work at this coming year. Well, this is one of them, and I'm not sure why this is up here. <laughs> Um, this is one of the, the Yellow Jacket Pueblo Solar Monolith Documentation Project. It's this uh, Yellow Jacket Pueblo is a large, large, large Pueblo. It's one of the largest Pueblos in the region. And it's on Ar Archaeological Conservancy land. And this uh, monolith is one that Kim Malville documented as being aligned to the summer solstice sunrise over uh, Lizard Head some 20 years ago. 20, 25 years ago. And I had an opportunity to visit this place and the monolith is le leaning now. It's being pushed over by a bush and it will probably likely fall at some point. We may not be able to stop it due to, you know, but what we needed is document it. I don't know if there's ever been any good documentation done here. There's also a model that I did of this site, but it's very, it's, it's much cruder and kind of hard to look at. <laughs> But um, the other site I would like to see, Ray and I went out to visit recently. Come on. As uh, Wallace Pueblo, uh, that is owned by Bruce Bradley. Bruce Bradley is a uh, very large, is, a, is a, one of the top archaeologists in the region in the Southwest. And he happens to personally own his own great house, Pueblo. It's a long story. But uh, when we visited there, he invited our group to come in and do some work, uh, landscape surveys. There might be a, a connection between Wallace and the great houses to the north of it, uh, including Escalani, and to Yellow, uh, to um, Yucca House National Monument down below. Uh, this place has a very uh, unique architectural feature. It's this right in here. It's this masonry staircase. It's the only time I have ever seen a, a masonry staircase uh, anywhere in the Southwest in any excavation. They did, you know, stepping stones, but this is a full on masonry staircase and it comes from this, these rooms here up on top and out onto the roof of this Kiva. And the horizon again around the area is uh, wonderful for uh, doing horizon studies. And uh, then we also have this little staircase that needs to be documented because it's very uh, important. The other thing, a feature about this Kiva is that it appears, and this is the only one I've seen it in, and Bruce Bradley showed me, is it appears that the top walls of the Kiva are actually domed in. They started to build it in a dome shape. Um, and that has some implications for possibly you know, recreating the sky. So we have an opportunity to do some work at uh, Wallace Great House. We don't have a lot of restrictions. What we need to do is talk to Bruce about uh, documentation, what he'd like to do, but we have an invitation to come into this site and do some work. So where is the site? I have. Uh, where is the site in relation to uh, Cortez? It's uh, about two or three miles due south of my house. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, uh, very easy, and, convenient, easy to get to. Yeah, and about uh, about two or three miles east of Cortez. 
Okay, so very close. That's super. Oh, yeah, and it's easy to get to. Exactly. Okay. Easy to get to. Yeah. And right now, his his level of documentation is basically taking pictures and doing some general wall, you know, maps. So we could really do some good work here with photogrammetry. And uh, he doesn't do anything with photogrammetry right now. So we've got a, an, an invitation to come in and do some work here. Okay, that sounds perfect. Yeah, and uh, help that out because it's a very complex site. <laughs> <laughs> very complex in its history um, and what happened at the site. Bruce is good at getting people to come and help because he, when we were there, he, he had, I don't know, a dozen people. Yeah, there are, I, I think that that's the crew from um, that was read by, led by Karen Kinnear. I know her, and it probably is the Isasanum chapter. Uh, Excavation. Oh yeah, that's probably right. Yeah, that's one thing I also want to ask him to do. When I go, I want Bruce and the gang there to teach me how to excavate. <laughs> so, be a part of the crew next year a little bit too. But yeah, this oh. is a that's a very cool staircase. I did a little three D model of it too. But we're getting on there for our time. So. Oh, you can get it. I see way. this one. Yep. Yep. So that's what the, the staircase looked like. I this is I did this from a crappy little camera that I took about ten minutes of photographs. Well, that I shows the power of photogrammetry. Yep. Yeah. And he's going to backfill this this particular feature next year. So we need to get this a really good photogrammetric model done of this before he backfills it, or any of the stress <laughs> spike gets backfilled. Because it's easy to go out there and take the pictures. <laughs> and also, we can use the pictures that he already has. Yeah. Okay, so let's uh, get out of that. How do we get out of that? Okay. How do we get back? Uh, okay, what I wanted to do right now is just kind of take out a little, that's the end of the program. Yeah. Are there any questions for me on my program? Yeah, Evelyn uh, wanted to know about the dates of the um, Wallace. Wallace? At, at no, not Wallace, Wallace but, uh, but this... Escalani? Es no. The, the Wallace Great House. Bruce's. Wallace's okay, yeah. Wallace the dates on it are... I'd have to find my note sheet on that, but they all go all the way from contemporary. So, you know, I, from what I understand, it's about 1080 all the way up through about 1220, 1230. There was a major occupation a, phase there too, a minor one. Yeah, it it's part of a of a um, larger con um, um, group of of pueblos in the immediate area. Yeah, right, right north of it Pretty is. Dense. Um, it's Wallace, Ida Jean, and one other one, <laughs> all within sight of each other. Great House Pueblo. Yeah. And they're all on private property. I don't have a question, Greg, but I have an observation I'd like to throw out. I thought it was really cool how you, you showed that Escalante was um, oriented towards the horizon landscape. But I, I also found it interesting and i'm not i'm not proposing that there's any kind of connection but uh the five degree offset from north is what timothy pocketot calls the cahokia grid for the entire site and surrounding uh communities are all share this five degree huh. uh, offset from north and um, uh, there's another site i could point to you right now uh casa grande the Great house, the, the big house at Casa Grande. Mm -hmm. It's also four degrees off on true north south. It's cocked off in the same direction. So yeah, there's something Cahokia. to it. Yes, there's something at to Cahokia. it. Yeah. <laughs> right. At Cahokia, it's oriented towards earlier burials. But it, it, it's interesting to speculate that maybe that site was chosen for its or you know, placed based upon its orientation towards the, the horizon features. 
yeah, no, I think that definitely is the case there is that they actually went up on top of that hill. They were doing things up on top of that hill long before that Pueblo was there, as Mary pointed out to us. And then um, when they built it, they they didn't do it north-south, true north-south, east-west. They, I think they definitely connected into those horizon features. Hmm. And I got to read this uh, paper by Wes Bernardini to really talk more about that. It, by the way, that's a that is a really good example of why it's wonderful to have um, a native person. In this case, in, in with in Mary's case, um, she has um, some experience and background in archaeology, in and and um, works for the. Um, Golly, what is it? New Mexico? At New Mexico, uh, yeah, Historic Preservation Office. Right. No, Thanks. Archaeology. <laughs> she works for Eric so, Lindman, you know, state archaeologist. Yeah. So she has a lot to offer from her um, cultural background with the tribe, but also um, she knows um, the um, archaeology community as well. No, very much. Very much the case. But this is the planetarium where yes. we uh, just gonna where take, we you out our a, take out a quick tour of what we did a little bit while we were down there in Argentina. Your tax dollars at work here. Um, went down to uh, this is the planetarium of the uh, at the National University of La Plata. Uh, the conference was held at the uh, School of Astronomical and Geophysical Sciences. This is a campus that uh, is about seven hectares in the uh, La Plata forest, as they call it. And it's a beautiful, wonderful area. It's a park, and, essentially. Yeah, <laughs> uh, it's a big, large garden park all over down there. So the park's everywhere. Come on. There we are. Hey. There we are, yeah. Okay. Registration, what we did is had a good opportunity to um, meet and greet and talk with lots of people while we were there. Jordan Houston, Clyde Ruggles, Dwayne Homaker, these are folks from Isaac. Gordon's one of ours too, but Gail Higginbottom and a lot of other folks that we had a good chance to meet and greet there. Uh, the it's actually at the La Plata University, which was founded in 1883. And there's 12 telescopes and observation devices on this particular campus. Some very old, some very new. Didn't get to see a lot of them, but lots of wonderful, beautiful, historic architecture. Uh, lots of people to meet. This is uh, Steve McCluskey. He's uh, our newest full member of the society, and we've been trying to get him for many, many years. Um, he's probably one of the most you know, renowned Hopi ethnographer, living Hopi ethnographers right now. Uh, and uh, he's a, uh, his studies are really most about A.M. Stevens, which is um, Fuchs's protege. So he fits into the Fuchs uh, project also. He's got lots of resources and we're gonna start sharing with him too. Uh, it's a beautiful place on the campus, lots of beautiful architecture. The planetarium dome itself, where we actually had our talks inside of it. There's Ray giving his talk. We all kind of set up on the side, and the presentation was projected on the dome of the planetarium, which was kind of weird. <laughs> so, but that's just the way it was. Uh, March night of the conference, we had a beautiful little uh, cocktail party opened by a string quartet. <laughs> and like I said, La Plata is a beautiful place with lots of uh, parks, uh, lots of vegetation. It was springtime down there. So you got to see all uh, the trees start to flower out. Uh, we took a day trip to uh, Buenos Aires in the middle of the conference. They took us all in a bus and of course, the food there is incredible, not stuff you can get in Cortez. I pretty much lived on tapas and uh, empanadas, <laughs> which were pretty good. 
And uh, then lots of other places we went. The, uh, this is the uh, tomb of San Martin. San Martin was the general that uh, founded uh, Argentina, got their movement going for their independence. Uh, Argentina became independent from Spain on July 9th, 1910. And this is a, a tomb of San Martin, which is across near there. the uh, Casa Roja, Red House, which is uh, the presidential palace now. And out in front, all these little rocks that were placed on the uh, statue of San Martin were and uh, had the names of all the people that died of COVID in Argentina. Wow. And they put that at the base of the statue. COVID took about 130,000 people in Argentina. Wow. Went to a place called Caminillas District, which is a beautiful, colorful, wonderful place, very vibrant tourist area with lots of outdoor cafes and a tango show every 100 feet. <laughs> so, probably one of the most beautiful things in La Plata was the uh, cathedral. Uh, it was nice to be able to go to many, many, many different cathedrals and churches while we were there. Uh, great place to visit. Uh, wonderful architecture, old stuff too. But after the conference, I definitely had to go out and take a couple of days in Buenos Aires. And uh, this is probably one of the most <laughs> fun things I ran into, which is the, um, uh, that was a celebration for the racing club, which is the one of the uh, soccer teams, soccer clubs, football clubs in Argentina. They just won their uh, uh, the Champion Cup, which is a regional cup. They don't play. They sit, they feed players up into the World Cup team, but none from this group. They were all just partying at the plaza in uh, in Buenos Aires at the Obelisk. The Obelisk is this thing here. It's about the size of the Washington Monument, it seems. Big party out front, so I just joined in. <laughs> this little race, I bought a little flag. Joined in, and so I had a great time in Argentina, and I think Ray did too. So that's what I've got for y'all. Any questions? <laughs> Looks like fun. Yeah, yeah well, we did have that. I I have to um, also add that um, we made a lot of contacts there right, right. with people in Isaac. The, the um, group that oversees the Oxford conferences, uh, but also with the SAIC group, the Latin American regional group um, of um, researchers and, and enthusiasts of cultural astronomy. Uh, really interesting group doing some very interesting research. Yeah. So that was that was nice to see. Yeah, we did get another member. His name is um, uh, Hans Marx de la Vega. He's from Mexico City. And so he uh, wants to work with us. And so does SIAC, uh, the Latin American version of STAS or, or, or the European group too. Um, they all want to work more closely with us to uh, develop their research and also to, a lot of it was about practicing English in a research setting. So that was also very interesting. Uh, the other thing that, uh, there were a couple of other good contacts. We uh, spent a lot of time with Steve Goldberg uh, okay. at the conference and uh, he is, he runs the uh, cultural astronomy program at the uh, University of Oklahoma, right? Yes, I believe. Norman, yeah. yes. and uh, so they're going to uh, work more closely with us, possibly maybe, you know, I, right now they're running a field school with Andy Monroe out of Chaco, um, getting permits out of Chaco Canyon, but they might be uh, working with us in the future uh, on projects of that kind. Um, also, he's, the, Steve Goldberg is the editor of the Isaac International Society of Archaeoastronomy and Astronomy and Culture, kind of the mother organization. And uh, so I signed up to kind of help them with uh, publication, getting you know, print publications. Uh, another person that we spoke with was Gail Higginbotham. 
Higginbottom, and she had a program about uh, creating accurate, uh, location accurate uh, horizon profiles, silhouette profiles that we could impart into Stellarium. Uh, so she's going to teach us how to do that. But probably I should, let me add to that, uh, yeah. Greg. We, we had a couple of talks about the use of Stellarium mm -hmm. from one of them from somebody who knows it back, that program backwards and forwards. Yeah. And um, his talk was about essentially investigating an archaeological site with, with um, photographs and st Stellarium and um, using the two together to show the uh, movement of light and shadow across this archaeological site. Was it that, was very was, impressive. Was that yeah. Zadi? Yeah, that's, uh, that's what I was going to say. Uh, uh, had, I spent a lot of time talking with Dr. Georg Ziadi. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And uh, he is, uh, that's the fellow you're talking about. Uh, he's from the Ludwig Boltzmann Institute in Vienna, Austria. Yeah. He works in their archaeological prospection and virtual archaeology division. And uh, he has the ability, he works very closely with the developers of Stellarium. He's kind of like a co-developer of Stellarium almost. Okay. And uh, he showed us, he said that what he, his specialty is importing models into Stellarium. And he could actually, with a, you know, basically a picture, general idea where it's at, date and time, he could reference a model by the light and shadow patterns. It's really amazing what he can do. Well, Greg, that's that's the missing piece for what we're doing with. Exactly. So, exactly. Yeah. And he knows how to, he, he was talking about how to take um, Horizon uh shots but you can't you got to take a certain kind of camera or not a certain kind of camera a camera that's set properly and um then you have to go through reference like the high points and low points and so he knows how to do all this and he's willing to come teach us how to do it yeah, <laughs> so. he's, he, he is definitely one of the developers of uh stellarium and he has a lot of great inca models that demonstrate light and shadow right Right, but his are all architectural. He's not. He, he wants to work with like what we're doing is distant horizon kind of work. So, you know, he would like to find if we could find money. He would come out, but I think he would. If we had an interesting enough project, they would come and help us with it. That's that's Those exactly the, what we need. We should we should definitely follow up with him. Yeah, these three connections with Georg, uh, Gail, and uh, Steve Goldberg. Uh, especially with Steve Goldberg, we really cemented a, a good future uh, collaboration with him and his group. So, yeah, um, a girl named Elizabeth and I will be his assistant editors at the journal. Hmm. Okay. Perfect. Yeah, I kind of, uh, I, I, I don't know about you know, at the papers, but I know there was a lot of interest in um, maybe getting print copies of the journal out because right now it's going to be digital only. Yep. Through the University of California, I think, in Southern California somewhere. Yep. Right. Sure. But um, they have no interest in doing a print version. And what I turned Steve Goldberg on to is how we did our, uh, you know, Amazon Kindle direct publishing print on demand book. So, yeah, if you see, we'll sign off on giving up print rights, <laughs> that, yeah, there's something we can do. Because people do want printed books. Yeah, we're still getting royalties from our. We're getting another royalty payment soon. But um, I understand, you know, one of the drives is to give it away for free, you know, and I think that will work for the digital version of it. But on a print version, someone's got to pay something. Yeah. <laughs> so, and uh, these are things that we're going to work. Uh, these are collaborations. Him and uh, Gayord, those are real solid. Real solid, good, as well as SIAC, uh, the Latin American group. Yeah. Really good, solid development of connections. 
when we went down there. Yeah, this whole conference was really interesting to me because um, I attended the first, second, and third of the Oxford conferences. And then from then on, my work just made it impossible for me to do that. And um, so it was an interesting um, experience to get back into that community, uh, the, in, into the international community um, again, uh, with a couple of the people who were there at Oxford One. <laughs> Steve was there, yeah. For example, <laughs> um, Steve um, Steve McCluskey. Guy right here. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. So, let me make sure we get to these two questions. Ah, oh, okay, good. We got those taken care of. So. Uh, I think I will try and get out of this. <laughs> I don't want to do that. I'm not sure how to get this up again. There we go. Um... <laughs> what are you trying to do, Greg? I try to get my uh, uh, get this expanded out. Um, stop share. Just stop sharing. Yeah. Oh, stop sharing. That's right. Yeah. There you go. Oh, <laughs> I'm doing this too. Ah. So, yeah, that's uh, kind of the experience we had down there. It was a wonderful experience. And um, I said we sold eight out of the 10 books that we brought down. Oh, Got wow. two new members. Um, so, made a little bit on the trip. Um, I want to thank the society because they did support me a little bit on this trip. Uh, thank you all. <laughs> well, and, they, uh, yeah, and also uh, just to let people know that if you like grilled meat, oh, this is the place to be. <laughs> <laughs> I saw it's, one vegetarian restaurant while I was there. <laughs> the, the national dish is called asada, which is assorted pieces of overdone meat. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly right. They took us out for, and I didn't show any pictures of this because they're trapped on my phone, but they took us out for um, a conference dinner on Thursday night, which was, and every meal there starts about nine o'clock at night. So for us that have to eat early, it didn't work out well. But yeah, the National Dishes Asada, which is a series of, they started with the inside of the cow and worked out. <laughs> <laughs> And it was all well done. It was just like, and this is supposed to be Argentina, you know, the home of the best beef in the world. I did get a filet mignon steak at the end of my last night, and it was the most wonderful filet mignon I've ever had. It was probably that big, you know, it was huge. <laughs> but you have to order it special. If you order the asada, you get a lot of overdone meat. <laughs> yeah. So the next uh, Isaac conference is 2024, is that right? 2025, uh, uh, Melbourne, 25. Australia. Yeah. So they selected an area? Yeah, Melbourne, yeah, Australia. Wayne, okay. Wayne Hammaker is, it will be. Wayne Hammaker is going to run that. I'm going to see if I can help him out running it. Thank you all. I I um, I need to yep. um, go have dinner. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> Hey, it's oh, about the right you, time, guys. isn't it, Ray? Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. That was really wonderful. I enjoyed yeah. every bit of it. Thank okay. you. Yes, thank you. Thank yeah, you. we're sorry you weren't there, Ivy, really. Yeah, I know, me too. Uh, <laughs> it's been so much fun to have you there. And if it's um, not too close to Christmas, we're looking at uh, December 20th as the next Journal Club. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, I've been talking to Kim and Gordon. We're both uh, at the conference also, and so they were willing to kind of do what uh, Ray and Greg had done. Oh, that's a good idea. Great. That sounds yeah. like a good idea. So while well, it's still fresh in everybody's mind, um, it looks like that's going to come together. So hopefully good. we can get them. And... Good, good, good. good. Nice. Yeah, great. they'll have a different. They'll have a different view of things. So that'll be good. <laughs> well, Thank good. You, Thank you. See y'all again. Thank you all. All right, good night. Good night, everybody. Good seeing everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Bye.